Okay, ladies and gentlemen, if you can just take your seats. What was that? Oh, you were checking out. What did we? Just check and see what we have in the drawer. <laughs> <laughs> careful, I. Careful. Yeah. I think you're. I think legend has it you're about 30 years too late to find a bottle there. So. <laughs> So welcome everybody, welcome uh, out to the suburbs for some of you. Um, we're uh, happy to return the uh, invitation of hosting uh, this uh, joint council meeting, uh, having had one in the fall in uh, Victoria. Uh, in a moment, uh, I will uh, call the Saanich meeting to order and then Mayor Fortin, Fortin, Fortin will call uh, his meeting to order. Uh, but just in terms of uh, preliminaries, um, there's technically two uh, council meetings going on here. Everybody has their own sets of procedures, so we're going to try and not uh, get ourselves uh, out of whack on uh, on anything. The presentation uh, from uh, BC Transit is for information. We've got sort of a protocol of uh, working through Saanich folks with questions and then Victoria folks with questions, Saanich folks with comments, Victoria folks with comments, and then, and then adjourning. Uh, Procedurally, we're not getting into motions here or decisions. Uh, we each have our procedures for our own councils and committees on how those things happen. So it's it's first off Q and A and and then comments and then adjourn and then the reports we have will go back to each each of our councils. Um, there's 18 of us. If everybody took 10 minutes, that's three hours. So we would ask that you be somewhat succinct. <laughs> Um, so that's it for preliminaries. Uh, so I will call uh, a Saanich Council meeting to order. I'll ask Mayor Fortin to call his meeting to order. Thank you. Uh, and I would call the meeting of Victoria, special meeting of the Victoria uh, City Council to order. And thank you very much for the gracious uh, welcome by all the staff and uh, most especially by the councillors of Saanich and the citizens that have joined us today. Thank you. Okay. And Victoria is supposed to have their agenda approved, apparently. There we go. All those in favor of the agenda we have in front of us? Opposed? See none opposed? Carried. Thank you. Okay, we're going to turn it over to a presentation uh, by uh, BC Transit. Up she comes. Welcome, Erin. Hello. Can you all hear me? Uh, my name is Erin Pinkerton. I'm the Director of Corporate Strategic Planning for BC Transit. I think I've met most of you around the room, so for the new councillors, welcome. Uh, what we're going to do today is just give a presentation, it's for information, and just we're going to walk through Douglas Street, the uptown to downtown corridor, where are we, what's going on with it. Let's just throw out some comments and suggestions and then hopefully just have some discussion on that. Where, where we left off was in December of 2010, way back, two years ago, was we had actually City Victoria and the municipality of Saanich um, endorse our transit future plan. And that was a big step for us because the transit future plan is what guides all the decisions we make to move transit forward in the region. And at the same time, we had endorsements for a rail-based solution on Douglas Street, and as well a significant milestone, which was identifying the Douglas Street corridor as the rapid transit corridor for the future. So those were some really big uh, steps that we had made that allowed us to move forward to continue on the rapid transit study linking the West Shore to Victoria. Um, we, however, there was still a lot of stuff that was up in the air because there were so many decisions that were being made at the same time. Uh, approving the alignment was one thing, but there was many, many, many detailed decisions to be made around where are the stations, where does the rapid transit alignment end, where does the rapid transit fit into the corridor, how do we determine where Uptown is. So there was still a lot of stuff to be figured out, and those were some of the resolutions that Council had passed for us to continue to work with staff on. The benefit that where we are and the, the success of what we've done is that we are, it allowed us to move forward to get the transit future plan adopted through the municipalities, through our capital regional district, as well as our transit commission. And that was really important to us because the transit future plan really is our building block for where we take transit in the future. 
And at the same time, the Victoria Rapid Transit project, the linking the West Shore project, also was approved in May, approved in the sense that it was approved for us to move forward to figure out the funding strategy. So it was, a, it was approved in that, yes, we want to move forward with this, but it's at the time, if everyone remembers, it was a $950 million project that we had no idea how the local side of the affordability would go. So there's a number of things going on there. The, and just to reiterate what the Transit Future Plan was envisioning was moving Victoria's transit system away from, uh, for lack of better terms, the spaghetti network of every single route doing everything to more of a streamlined service. The streamlined service is where you start to create corridors, it's where you start to create uh, presence of transit in certain areas. And that was what the whole Transit Future Plan was predicated on was we want to move towards this direction, how do we do that? And, and the Transit Future Plan, when we were out here presenting to councils for many, many years about it, we kept saying it's not a shelf document, we will move forward on it. And so I just wanted to talk about where are we with the Transit Future Plan. And we've had some successes so far. As we started to streamline services to McKenzie and to UVic to start to mirror what the network will look like. We implemented Google Trip Planner, which was a big success in the region. That's where you can go on and type in your starting address and your end address, and it'll tell you exactly how to get there by transit. So you don't have to read our schedule book. You don't have to figure out our 55 routes. It'll tell you the best way to get there. Since January of 2011, so uh, sorry, since January of 2012, we've already had about 50,000 hits to the site. So it's become very successful. Our customers love this type of technology. The other thing is we completed the McTavish Park and Ride and Exchange. The Park and Ride has allowed us, um, if we go back to this slide, where we talked about streamlining service, is if you're going to start to put transit on specific corridors, you do need to provide a way for people to use the service without always having to make a connection to a community service. So that's where Park and Rides come in, is when we get out to our outer communities, it's looking at how can I use both my bike, walking, my car, and use transit at the same time. And there's a lot of stuff going on as well is we have partnered with the Capital Regional District to look f work on the local funding task force. So that committee is chaired by the Capital Regional District and BC Transit is a partner in that study. And what that's looking at is how do we invest and help fund major infrastructure projects in the region? And it could, it, it's just infrastructure. So right now we have a way of putting more buses on the road, we have funding mechanisms that allow us to put service on the road, but how do we make these major infrastructure investments in transit that, that we're looking at in terms of getting priority out to the West Shore, improving service to UVic, improving service up to the peninsula? And that local funding task force is looking at all the options on the table in terms of wh here's what we currently have for funding transit in Victoria, and here are all the options we'd like to look at. Uh, TransLink, our partner across the water, is also doing similar studies all the time. And we're also continuing to go out there and, and ask our municipal partners to help us engage in transit priority. Uh, anybody who works in transit, it's, it's what we care about. The quicker we can move our buses through the network, the better service we can provide, the more reliable it becomes, and the less hours we have to use to provide service just because it's taking us longer. So we're continuing to go out to our municipal partners and ask for partnerships in terms of working on transit priority. And the present, when I get further on, we're going to talk about that in a little bit more detail. And we're continuing to invest on our on-street amenities. Our customers have told us many, many times that Yes, frequency is important. Having service show up every five minutes, every six minutes, that's great. But some of our routes can't do that. And not all of our services are that frequent. And so having amenities such as shelters is such a simple thing that we can do to help make the customer experience better. Uh, in 2010, BC Transit worked with our municipal partners to start to develop a shelter program that would have consistent look and feel, um, free maintenance, like easier maintenance to maintain. As well, we've partnered with the province to provide funding for these shelters that were traditionally provided 100% by municipalities. So to date, we've installed about 75 of these in the Victoria region, and we're continuing to move forward on that program, and I'm not sure if you've seen them around, but those are the new shelter designs, and we're piloting right now a solar design so we don't always um, have to connect into the electrical system so the shelter can be lit up through solar panels. And then there's a lot to work on as well. Is we have identified through the Transit Future Plan that we have to start looking at all of the service that's on our road, all of the service that we have provided through these number of routes and say, is there things we can start doing now? Can we start 
changing service, modifying service that would be, I don't want to say cost savings, but cost neutral. So what can we do with the existing service? And so we're going to be undertaking a service review of the Victoria transit system to say where are some efficiencies we can find, where can we allocate hours better. We're also working continually to improve issues and problems as they arrive within our existing service. We have pass-ups to UVic. We have a growing network out to the D&D dockyard area that we need to provide service to. And we have growing congestion out to the highway, out to the West Shore. That's a consistent thing we're looking at providing. As well as we get new requests for service to Dean Park, Bear Mountain. And as new developments come up, we have requests for more and more service. So those are some of the areas we're working on. And without service related, we still have infrastructure we have to deal with, and we are moving forward on some of those. We are working with UVic to look at where the long-term location of our transit exchange should be. One of, the, the, one of our issues we're having right now is we can't put any more buses into UVic because our exchange is at capacity. UVic at the same time is working on a long-term campus, campus plan to say where should we be incorporating transit. So that's really important to us is to figure out where the long-term location of the UVic location will be. And we're continuing to look into the Uptown Exchange, and I'll talk about that in a couple slides where we are with that. We have purchased property to allow us to build our third transit operations and maintenance facility when, we're, when, we're, when we hit more buses in the future, is we are at capacity. So if we wanna expand more service, we wanna meet the vision of the Transit Future Plan, we need another operations and maintenance facility. We're continuing to look at where we could put park and rides in the West Shore. Uh, there's conversations going on right now about partnering with the casino in View Royal, about using the parkade there for some park and ride opportunities. So there's lots of discussions going on. And we're continuing to part with municipalities wherever we can to work on joint studies that would enable transit and the municipality to get joint benefits, such as we're partnered on the Shelburne Corridor study, we are partnered on the Admiral's Road study, we're partnering, uh, we're part of the CRD Regional Transportation study, we're part of Highway 17 study, and the MOT is doing Highway Interim Improvements study as well. So we're part of all of those, trying to make sure that what we had wanted to succeed in the Transit Future Plan actually gets implemented. And all of the Transit Future Plan, one of the first priorities that was identified was linking the Victoria to the West Shore through the Rapid Transit project. And where we are on that is I talked earlier about we're kind of in this funding development phase, is before we move forward and get into any more detailed design, before we write the final business case, before we request funding from the federal government or even the province, is we need to get an understanding of what the local affordability really is. And that's where that local funding task force comes in. The scope of the project that was presented as the planning project was the 40-year vision. It was, this is the rapid transit project that will link to the West Shore that meets the 40-year um, build out, it meets the 40-year service targets. And so that's the question is, is what level of scope would we want to proceed with as a region moving forward? Uh, that's the next phase, is there's no point in moving forward before we all have agreement as to what we want to do. And when I say scope, it could mean where do we go to in the West Shore? What happens first? How much service frequency do we want? Um, if, the, if we reduce the service frequency, you could save on the number of light rail vehicles you need to buy. Do we do grade separation from day one or do you do it in year 20? So all of those things factor into how much we go forward for asking from the start. But what, what this project did do, some of the benefits it allowed us to do is to get buy-in on the long-term vision and, and more importantly, from a transit point of view, is get agreement onto that rapid transit alignment. Understanding where the alignment is allows us to make so many decisions to make our step forward in terms of let's get on with something. And that's the one thing we heard at the last round of consultation is even if we got approval tomorrow to fund a light rail project by all the partners, all the funding sources, we still have to go through engineering, design, procuring of vehicles, um, acquiring the property, just all of that, you're looking at four, five to six years. So the, the public is saying to us, we get the long-term vision, we support it, but what can you do now to move us forward? And that's why we're here, is the key corridor between uptown and downtown is, well, what, what can we do? We know the long-term vision, what are, there th what are the outstanding items that we can look into? What can we start getting onto right away? And there's a couple items I'm gonna touch in on. One of them is, where are we with uptown and what can we do with that? Transit signal priority on Douglas Street, it's a, something we could be starting and we are working on right now. Finalizing the configuration in terms of where it sits in the roadway, where rapid transit would sit, and I'll talk in detail about why that's so important. And looking at priority interim measures. And the two 
finalizing the configuration on Douglas Street and the linkage to identifying interim measures is really important, is if we're going to look at interim measures, we better know what the long-term vision is going to be. So at Uptown, uh, we have recently just completed the acquisition of the private properties that were required to consolidate a footprint of properties in the Uptown area so that we can now move forward in terms of getting together with our partners at Saanich, Victoria, the Capital Regional District, the M and Ministry of Highways, in terms of designing and figuring out what this exchange should look like, how it, what's the look and feel. There are many, many opportunities here in terms of land development, um, transit-oriented development. What are the stepping stones for such a great infrastructure piece at the hub of the transit network? And so the properties have been purchased, and now what we have to do is look in terms of how can we move forward? Do we wait for rapid transit in the future to build an uptown exchange, or is there a way in which we can phase in the development of uptown? Because the uptown exchange, it's critical for linking the West Shore. It also has enabled us to improve service out to the West Shore as well as to the peninsula. If you think about the transit future map and the grids that it was doing, it was all based on that one section. The transit signal priority in in 2011, we reactivated this project between the City of Victoria, Saanich, and Ministry of Transportation and BC Transit. Not to get into the technical details around controllers and transponders, but we had to all agree on what was our infrastructure along the corridor and make sure we were all th the infrastructure was talking. So we've had some pretty good success recently working together in getting these controllers and softwares upgraded to the point where they're ready to be turned on. We are upgrading our buses, so the buses have a, a transponder on them that basically when it's approaching a green light, if the bus is approaching the green light, it can extend the green by up to seven seconds to let the bus get through it. So we're updating our software on the buses so the buses can do that, and then we're hoping to go test, test the corridor in March and April so we can say finally with confidence that the transit signal priority on Douglas Street is turned on and working. And that is one of the first steps is get the get the buses through the signals when they can get to the green light quicker. And then within the roadway, there's, it's the technical side of it now, but there's some re real key things to understand is where do you put rapid transit? And we have had conversations at council meetings about this in terms of curb, do you put it on the side, do you put it in the middle, do you put it on one side, do you put it up top? Really, and, and we, I've said this before, the key to understanding it is they all work. It's just a matter of getting into a finer understanding of the interactions between the pedestrians, the vehicles, the transit users, and the transit reliability. So it's looking at a scorecard in terms of one option might be really good for transit, might not be as good for the vehicle. Another option might be very good for vehicle traffic, but it, it impacts transit reliability. And then it's taking all of those to understand which one makes sense. When we had originally come out with the project to help discuss these concepts, we had brought in some renderings to show what it could look like. What these configurations and the renderings allowed us to do was really it was about making sure that we had discussed the right of way and the amount of space required on Douglas Street to fit in uh, an exclusive transit alignment, bike lanes, you know, turning lanes, and vehicle traffic. So that was what we had done these for, is at this stage what we've done is more of a high level assessment of could we fit everything into the roadway, which we agreed, yes, it all can fit in. Now what we're trying to get into more detail is, okay, well, which one are we actually going to move forward with? And uh, I'll bring in the, our, our favorite girl with a little balloon on the left there. <laughs> She's in all the drawings. <laughs> and so when we had come to councils Back in 2010, we had done a very detailed evaluation in terms of the impact to pedestrians, vehicles, traffic. Um, how did it link into the side cross streets for transit? That's very important, is if you're transferring off of one alignment onto another bus service, the impact of your walking route is very significant in terms of do you have to cross a five-way intersection or do you get off on one side and just quickly walk to your connection? And what this had allowed us to do through this detailed assessment was for us to confirm at that time that south of Hillside, Hillside to Humboldt, that the couplet options on Government and Blanchard were not favored well, and it allowed us to confirm it was Douglas Street. You can see that the scores between side running and curb and medium were still very close. And so from a BC Transit technical analysis, we had come out with side running as the optimal option, but we had identified through those meetings that there was further work to just 
get into more understanding as to what that meant. And you can see how close the scores were. So you can see that any or all of them could work. <laughs> yeah, I'll, I'll send a copy of the presentation. OK. <laughs> you can read that? OK. <laughs> So that's the thing, is, is why is it so important to figure out where it fits? Well, the planning and engineering staff of both municipalities, as well as BC Transit, are making daily decisions that impact this corridor around land use, setbacks, zoning, where should stations be? And it does make it very difficult to react to these types of decisions without knowing the fine tooth detail. Understanding where the configuration will be will allow us to move forward much more confidently on could we implement transit priority measures. It also allows us to make decisions about underground utilities. We get referrals from TELUS and BC Hydro about we want to move utilities, and we don't know yet what the right answer is. And where does the cycling infrastructure go on Douglas Street? That was a conversation that we had never really finalized and closed the loop on, but it was important to understand. Also, it lo I, I mentioned this before, and I, I'll just say it again, because it's that the cross street bus routes in terms of where we put the stations for them as well, it, it actually impacts quite significantly depending on whether or not you're in the curb, on the middle, or on the side, in terms of where do you locate those. And then the terminus. When we had originally looked at the alignment development, at that time we didn't have a technology recommended. And so when you're looking at a bus-based technology, a t the endpoint needs a loop so the bus can turn around. If you're looking at a rail-based technology, you need a switchback, so it changes what type of endpoint you might be looking at. And the endpoint is very specific for City of Victoria because Transit and the City of Victoria would be looking at partnering in terms of what does that endpoint look like, what connects into it, what are the facilities around that location. And then a slight sales pitch now for interim <laughs> is when we are going out asking for partnership from municipalities to look at interim measures, there's many different ways in which we talk about interim measures is why, why do interim measures, why not just build the system now is we are looking at if there's so many different ways you can look at it. It's where is your traffic, where is your congestion, uh, where is your employment, where is your density and this is just one example is this is the total passengers we carry on the corridor on transit alone and you can see the Douglas Street corridor is such a key corridor for moving our people. The Douglas Street corridor is also carries, accommodates 33% of the region's employment and is carrying the majority of our bus routes. So you can imagine that any travel time advantage we can get is not just impacting one bus route, it's impacting all 20 of them that get that benefit. And I've shown this slide before, but I'll, I just love it so much, so I'll put it up again. Is the other, re when you're looking at from a transit perspective, where do you put priority is you look at well, how much space is being used and who's using what system? And, and on Douglas Street, transit's carrying about 40% of the people that were moving on that corridor and using about 3% of the vehicle space. And so you're starting to look at giving priority to the vehicles in which are moving people. And I've, I've said it before is that with the amount of people that transit's moving every one to three minutes during peak time is that if we didn't have transit, Douglas Street would need to be eight lanes wide. And so we're just trying to keep, continue to squeeze ourselves onto Douglas Street and it's looking at, well, how can we get transit ahead? And, and from a transit perspective, the, bear with me as I show a complex graph. The, the red line is, yeah, <laughs> well, I'll just describe it. So the, <laughs> the red line is our schedule and the blue dots are what we actually achieve. So obviously, any variability, the wider the variability, the harder it is for us to plan for service. So if, you're tr if you schedule that service should take 12 minutes, but it actually takes 32, what we then get is we miss our schedule, we don't get reliable service, people miss their connections. So what transit priority tries to do is minimize the gap in terms of how the variability of the travel is along the corridor. And transit priority, means a lot of different things it, and this is where it's really important is right now we're working on coordinated signals through transit signal priority. If you look at the spectrum, the light rail rapid transit project recommended going all the way to the other end of the spectrum to say we want exclusive transit way with a one system type service, one route up that corridor. But you can see that we have quite a bit of distance to get from one side of the spectrum to the other. And that would be where we're looking at, well, how do we move closer to the long-term plan through using any of the transit priority options that are available, either through 
Q jumpers, peak only lanes, bus lanes, HOV lanes, any of those types of concepts which could help us move forward to get to our desired end goal. And this uh, was the recommendation that's included in your council package. So I don't know if we wanted to touch on that because it's for information only. But I guess what we were here from a transit point of view and we're working with Saanich Engineering and planning is we want to continue to move forward to finalize that configuration on Douglas Street so that we can <coughs> confirm where it is, move forward on interim study planning, and continue to look at up the uptown to downtown corridor as a key transit phase in the region. Thank you. Yeah, that's the recommendation that's going to go to a future Saanich meeting and a future Victoria meeting. Okay. <coughs> so at this point, uh, questions from members of Saanich Council? Councillor Wade. Thank you, I'll Brown. start. Um, just a couple of questions um, with respect to the business involvement in the weighting of the options. What, what, I wasn't here, what was the business involvement in that? At the time when we had weighted the alignment options, we had used a number of techniques, uh, one of them being we had done public open houses, and as well, we had also done a business community survey along the corridor to get engagement about what are the key factors for businesses in terms of how their customers get there, what, um, what impacts a customer in terms of a lot of discussion was around parking spaces and access and uh, those types of questions. And when we get into, that's some of the things we need to get into when we get into the further review is what are the impacts. Thank you. I, I was just mindful of the experience in Vancouver where businesses were, were adversely affected and wanting to make sure that we're thinking that through all the way this time. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Mr. Mayor. Um, Aaron, I just wanted to know, around the alignment, did, uh, did you look at undergrounding the wiring, hydro lines, all those things, and what that kind of cost would add to the project? At this point, we had not included those types of discussions because they would happen at the design stage. Uh, one of the questions that's still outstanding in terms of the light rail technology is whether or not the light rail is powered um, from the surface or powered from above, which would also impact the, the utility decisions. Oh, okay, and, and so um, there might be some opportunity for selling off some of, um, to other uh, agencies if we could put everything underground. Could we, could the, um, could there be some funding opportunity to come? There, yeah, there could potentially be. Yeah, that's what I think. Okay, thanks. Thanks, Mr. Mayor. Um, Aaron, um, there are those of us sitting around here, I think, who are, are very excited by the project, but also have a realization that the, some of the public streets you are going through are some of the most important public places we have for social interaction, for commercial interaction, and things of that nature. So uh, it's, I think, important to a number of us, probably all of us, that this project takes a complete streets uh, approach where it recognizes the importance of streets for being other than a conduit to move vehicles through. Uh, I just wanted to get your comments on uh, whether or not transit is recognizing those concerns and how you're addressing them. Well, I think uh, that goes back to the, the statement I made about understanding the impact to not only just transit but the pedestrians, the the businesses, the vehicle drivers. From a transit perspective, if we could choose tomorrow, we'd want the, whatever option gets us through as quick as possible with as minimal friction. Uh, we recognize that this is the corridor that we're trying to grow. Um, as well, when we look at transit in terms of the ability to move people, is we recognize that the concept of the way in which transit fits into the streetscape is gonna be very important in growing the ridership. Thank you, and, and just as a follow-up on that, because you almost mentioned it there, uh, in fact, uh, again, there are some of us who believe that that corridor is perhaps the premier opportunity in the region for redevelopment and development of new communities. Uh, transit fundamentally is an enabler for that. Uh, is, is that factoring into the discussions and decisions you're making? Well, I, I think the land use discussion is what we're partnering with in terms of the planners and engineers at city and the city of Victoria and Saanich. But 
it, we, since the alignment has been announced, even from two years ago, is we still get many, many, many calls from people who are interested in leasing or buying or developing on that corridor, and they, and they want to know the detail. Is there a station right outside? Is it close by? What kind of setbacks do we need? And that's why it's so important that we continue on with those discussions so we don't lose the density that we had envisioned as part of the corridor. Yeah, so fundamentally, you're working within a climate of awareness of the potential for development mm -hmm. inside that corridor. And, and so far, we've been very successful with both council, both municipal staffs, that all development referrals along Douglas Street right now are going through that level of scrutiny in terms of how does this impact the future rapid transit alignment. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Hi, Aaron. Hi. Um, yeah, following on to what uh, Councillor Derman said, um, development needs certainty, and uh, I certainly hope that you're, you're in discussion uh, with the um, development community, UDI and so forth, because uh, this, and, and I'm not sure whether corridor is the, is the real term for this, because um, we're not just trying to rush through here. Uh, this can be a really vibrant urban space. Uh, we have to tie land use to our long-term transportation needs. So um, I'm envisaging not only um, commercial development, but maybe commercial with residential on top. I'm looking at public open spaces. I'm looking at greenways and so forth. So um, I, I just hope that we're not just tying this to transportation. I hope there's conversations happening uh, so that you are discussing things with uh, develop the development community, because um, I, I think this is an opportunity, the best opportunity probably we've had uh, to develop uh, a really important corridor. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. I just had one specific question I wanted to ask, and that was about the um, uptown, uh, the bus exchange. Can you um, elaborate at this point how far along you are with this and with the potential and of that happening? At, at this point, we have been working in the background to secure the footprint through the properties, and the properties that have been purchased are being leased back to the tenants that were already there. That's as far as it's gone. There was a concept developed in order to satisfy that we think that was enough space, but the engagement in terms of the exchange development and how it fits, it needs a lot of work between the partners. Um, the Galloping Goose is running right through there as a hub. There's Cary and Ravine Road. There's the highway. It's the entrance to Saanich. So at this point, it's just looking at the footprint. Okay, good. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, Aaron, I was, well, thank you very much for the presentation. Um, I was quite intrigued by the slide that indicated that almost 40% of people who move through Douglas uh, or on Douglas are carried by transit. Um, I think that's a very important point to remember in terms of capacity and, and how much of that roadway is dedicated for that use. Um, I also find this sort of evolution of, of uh, the transit right-of-way uh, very interesting. I hadn't quite seen it in those terms before. Um, I, I think it's quite timely as we've received this letter from the University of Victoria Student Society as well as the Camosun Student Society talking about their preference for some of the interim measures including HOV lanes. Um, I wondered if you could comment on, on that and whether or not you see that as, as a priority as an interim measure or perhaps it's a combination of, of some of these. Uh, and then I'll allow you to answer before I uh, have a supplemental if I can. <laughs> Thanks, Dean. <laughs> uh, the, the HOV lanes, the way I would describe it is, um, yes, HOV lanes are a way in which moving high occupancy vehicles through lanes of traffic. At this point, I couldn't comment on the uh, success of HOV lanes on Douglas Street because further analysis would be needed. If you look at bus lanes, I would describe that as there's, it's its own continuum within itself. HOV lanes typically are two plus, which two plus drivers and bus lanes are essentially an HOV lane, but requiring six plus, for example. So what would need to be further work in order to say, could we go ahead with HOV lanes would be, what would be the value is if we went with two plus, would it do anything to allow transit to get through quicker? If we went with three plus, what would that mean? So that's where we'd have to go in terms of um, further investigation on that analysis. Thank you. Um, the other comment made in the letter is that there are a number of key corridors, major corridors, that uh, are problematic uh, in the view of the Student Society, and I'm sure in the view of transit. 
um, in terms of pass-ups and the ability to overcome some of those pass-ups by maybe implementing some of these measures that would be interim on Douglas, but perhaps longer term in other corridors. Can you give us a sense of uh, how you see that um, process uh, unfolding? As obviously there'd be quite a bit of work between transit and the municipalities in order to make that happen. Yeah, what, what we're requesting from municipalities, uh, either unofficially or officially, is to the corridors where we would want to investigate further transit priority are clearly outlined in the Transit Future Plan. To bring them up would be Esquimalt, Fort, um, Richmond, Shelburne, Mackenzie, Highway 17. Like, those are the corridors. Uh, BC Transit would want to partner with the municipalities to ensure that we had started the studies together. So at this point, we're still, we're working with, on the Highway 17 strategy that was announced yesterday. Um, and we, we have not had engagement yet to continue on to look at any other transit priority on those corridors. So we're looking for willing partners to partner with us. Thank you very much. The last go around we had on Douglas Street, they came before us and said the business community was totally supportive except, you know, for a few minor items. At the end of the day, they were major items that they were concerned about and we didn't go ahead on it for various reasons. And just a comment, I hope we will engage the business community in a fairly substantial way. Coming back to the business case and our whole funding for the infamous sewage treatment in the area, and to get commitment from the senior levels of government, it required a fairly rigid business case. And as I look at what we have here, as we look at the province and the federal government for funding, do we really have a firm business case in place that's being critiqued by a third party? And at what point can we seriously move ahead on it? I'm just going back to the chart. Okay, so that's phase two. In order to, in, if we're gonna invest the money required to do a partnerships assessment, the value for money assessment, a third party independent review of the details around ridership forecasts and costing, and getting confirmation of all of the facts and data that, because the project's so large, getting those confirmed, is that would be the next phase, is without having any sort of commitment at this point from the locals or even the province or the feds that this is something we wanna proceed, that's where we've put it into its own phase in terms of we're not going to go there unless we have some understanding this is what we want to investigate because something like that, a detailed business case of that size, takes a long time and can cost millions of dollars. Thank you. I guess my personal life, I always like a plan B, not just an interim measure, but if something doesn't look like it's a sure thing, I ask myself, what's a plan B? And I guess I ask us in transit, at what point do we start working and thinking seriously about doing some cost evaluations on plan B, what it might look like? Uh, I mean, transit's always looking at things we can do in the interim. Not uh, interim, long-term plan B. Is there any thoughts there? Well, I think one of the things that we want to talk about is through this discussion on local funding is looking at the magnitude of scope. Mm -hmm. So are there things that we can do, again, like the, we don't, do we need a 40-year build out right away? What are things that we can do in the interim? Are there things along the highway? Those have to be investigated. Could we look at changing the way in which we operate the service? Knowing though that the long-term plan is still the ultimate plan that we've spent years analyzing, we have to, I, I just think we have to go back to the scope and say, what would we do? If we can't afford this, what are we gonna do? So we, we're always having those conversations back at the, uh, at the house. Thank you and thanks for your presentation. Thank you. I have a comment in the form of a question. <laughs> oh, great. <laughs> Just hold, hold your breath waiting for the question mark because it will come, but, but I will be brief. Um, I was really looking forward to the presentation, Aaron, based on the, the last one that we'd seen quite some time ago. And at that time, I think one of the um, issues or opportunities that was identified was the need to really strongly link and connect with land use planning. So I have to admit, coming here today, I really expected something quite dramatically different than, than what I've actually, well, what we were able to see, but <laughs> able at least to follow with your comments. And it seems to me that at best, um, transit is reacting 
to land use planning and working with the, the, the various uh, planning departments. But I think certainly what I was hoping to see, and I think others as well, was an, a, a true integration. And in, in many jurisdictions, when you're doing transit planning, you don't start with the center line, you start with the property line and you work your way to the middle. And I'm still not seeing that. And I think it's, I'm probably speaking in support of Councillor Derman's comments and also Councillor Gerard's comments that for this to be successful, that has to happen. And um, my question would be is, what would it take to truly have an integrated process? Because when I look at it today and I look at the proposed motion that will come forward to our respective councils, I'm not able to support it at the moment. And it's that lack of true integration with land use planning. Mm -hmm. And so what would it take to really get us to that point where we're starting with the private property line and moving out to the center line to have a truly integrated uh, plan and vision for the corridor? Well, I, c I can only comment on transit's influence over land use in terms of transit can work with the municipal planners to help to identify what is a transit oriented development look like. Uh, but in terms of the rezoning or the zoning bylaws and the way in which density is put onto the corridor, it's really a partnership that has to be led by the municipalities as well. So transit can be there to support in terms of giving indications around what are some of the variances you can do on parking, how can you ensure upfront developments instead of at the back developments, where do you put the parking, what is the connection to transit, and all we can do is really help the guidance on that. Well, perhaps just as a flag to, to um, certainly my own council as well, because I know that there is some work being done with our planning department, but it just doesn't seem to be coming through uh, in the presentation. So perhaps there's more that we can do in the meantime to really truly integrate, especially when we're dealing with areas that we're not going to be seeing redevelopment in. We've got two very different kinds of areas mm -hmm. along the corridor. Somewhere we'll be planning for that redevelopment, but where we're not, how do we make sure we still have a proper pedestrian area and areas where people want to walk in addition to taking transit and not just being on that bus and going from point A to right. point B. So whatever we need to do, I'll, I guess we'll get it on our agenda for our council and I would certainly encourage Saanich if they're not doing that to, to encourage that with their staff as well. Thank you. Yeah, and I, I think that's a good point because uh, through the rapid transit project there was um, the, when you move to rapid transit, the number of stations you have along the corridor reduces, so you have them further spaced out, which really reiterates the fact that walking between the stations is going to become that much more important when you have less spots, stops. Okay. Councillor thornton Joe, do you have any questions? No, thank you, Your Worship. My questions have been asked. Thank you. Councillor Young? If we get in a situation where um, it does not appear that um, provincial funding is is going to be forthcoming within the immediate future. Uh, then I understand from what you said that we push the uh, the timeline for implementation of rail rapid transit uh, into the range of half a dozen years. Um, and so I guess with regard to the what we'd call the interim solutions. Um, You've asked for uh, that, that you should be looking at the identification of preferred routing with regard to median side running, et cetera. Will that decision be colored by um, the, the fact that um, you have to implement it now, given today's technology and what you have, uh, but you're also looking forward to the future? And, and I guess specifically, um, you've identified side running as your sort of long-term option for rail, which is what you would do if you were starting to build it today. But I guess the question is, suppose that's not going to happen and we are going to evolve toward that system. Does that change the weighting and make it more likely that you're going to want to uh, w look at sort of a side running system that is much closer to what we have today so right. that in fact if a municipality decides that such and such a store has to have the parking on the street in front of it and they don't want it for that section that you can blend that in with uh, with the sort of long-term outcome well the the technical analysis around the alignments was done in the sense that it would operate for both bus or rail so from a purely technical point of view, if we chose the alignment tomorrow, we could operate buses in them. 
recognizing the complete street approach and the way in which the interaction between the rail and the bus was perceived differently from even our public, is that some of the considerations that have to be given is if side running is selected as the ultimate plan and th that's what's needed, could we start with um, peak only bus lanes on the curb, which is easier to implement, just knowing where the property lines and right of ways have to be. So a lot of the configuration decision comes down from, from my point of view is where, where are the accesses that need to be closed in the future in order to accommodate that future alignment? If a rezoning comes up, is, is it the time then to close off accesses? What are some of the decisions around the locations when development permits come through? So it's just trying to understand the linkage between both those. And, and the question is, is when, when the median busway plan was originally proposed, the intent of that was to mirror what would be eventually a rail service. And so that's where the decision has to come in, is do we build the alignment, the ultimate alignment right now and throw buses on it, or do we do something different, which is painting curbs on the side very quickly. I'll go out tonight and do it if, if someone wants to join me. <laughs> and, and the other thing too is, as everyone remembers, there was about 154 parking spots along that corridor that would also have to be removed to accommodate the footprint of the rapid transit alignment. So are there things we could do now to remove those parking spots, start to get some successes in without ultimately building it out? I guess just to follow up though, I, I, I guess the question is you will take into account in that planning the difficulty of having one section of side running phasing into a section where we're not doing anything and that, that'll enter into your waiting process, I'm assuming. Mm -hmm. And I think the other thing that needs to be considered is if you're running, if you build, say, side running now and you rad buses along it and then you went to switch to rail, what would be the implementation plan for that compared to if you were running curb bus lanes and you wanted to switch to side running to build rail? Like, those are the kind of things we have to consider. Thank you. Councillor Alto. Thank you. <clears throat> I have a couple of specific questions and then one general question. Uh, but first, uh, I ride the buses a lot and I love the trip planner, so kudos for that. Uh, you mentioned earlier that um, you're in instituting this uh, common bus shelter program and the 75 that are already there. How many are you planning to put in altogether in the end? Um, we have worked with the province to allocate out a provincial fund across the, across the province uh, annually. And what we do is we have a, an evaluation process, so municipalities from all over the province put in requests in terms of we'd like to put shelters at these locations for the following reasons. Our fund right now I think can accommodate up to 100 to 150 shelters per year across the province. The other thing that the program does is it allows municipalities to direct purchase from these suppliers. That was one of the things we heard from around the province is if you're in a smaller community, to go out to RFP to buy two shelters is really difficult so they can use the BC Transit Provincial Program to buy directly as well. So we're just continuing to try to get more in. Okay, thanks. Uh, you also referenced sort of your, I guess it's an ongoing performance route review, and I guess, it, it, did I hear that correctly, that it is an ongoing process, or is it something for which you have a timeline and that at a certain point you're gonna look at that and then make changes and that sort of thing? We, we review our routes ongoing. This would be a more formalized process which actually looks at setting transit service guidelines uh, and then runs the routes through an evaluation. So you can come up with your, for lack of better words, top performers, low performers. What would you do with the low performers? There's something we can do. How do we make sure the top performers keep working? And, and bringing it more formalized so we can start to make educated decisions on where to put the hours in. So do you do that on an ongoing basis or do you have a sense of at this point now we're going to use that information to make these changes? We're hoping for the route performance for Victoria to have something at least an initial discussion ready for the fall so we can come in and say okay here's where we think some of this, the synergies and efficiencies can be made within the existing system. Thank you and finally um, a number of folks have uh, commented about the effect of significant changes, uh, changes to transit to the businesses that front on them. And I know there's been much discussion about the pros and cons of that. And I wonder if you could speak sort of generally, if not today, if you'd be able to provide the information for any evidentiary documentation that will speak to the benefits of the adjacent businesses once an enhanced, uh, either whether it's rapid transit or enhanced buses or whatever, the relationship between the businesses once that uh, type of enhanced transit is in place. Do you have that? Can you speak to that today, or is that something you can provide us with? Um, I mean, I can't speak in detail, but there's definitely a lot of empirical evidence that can be provided in terms of the benefit of 
uh, significant transit improvements to corridors and the businesses that are located along them, and even right. within the walking distance. Yeah, we can get that for you. That would be great. I'd really yeah. appreciate it. Thank you very much. It's a great presentation. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Isaac? Uh, Councillor Gudgeon has passed. And we're just at the question, please? Just at the yes. question, please. Uh, what kind of cost estimates have been arrived at for HOV and for light rail, but particularly for uptown to downtown? Because I think the 905 million scared a lot of people, and it scared me personally. I don't, don't think it's within the fiscal resources of the region right now in the middle of a recession to contemplate a project of that magnitude. So I think for me to be comfortable supporting these recommendations, I'd like even a rough estimate of what would we be looking at for HOV, what would we be looking at for rail, and then we could plan perhaps how to phase in uh, those two models. And I do share the view um, that I don't think the transit planning can precede the bigger question of the land use planning. The um, costing in terms of well, how much would it cost for like a bus lane or an HOV lane, that would have to come out of the results of the work that we would go away and be doing with the municipal planners and engineers. So we would come back with recommendations around what is the final configuration, and here are some interim measures and their costs that we could be implementing. But at this point, we don't have those numbers. The number that's being presented is the complete build out of a rapid transit alignment to the West Shore, including the trains, the maintenance facility, and all of the infrastructure. I think the challenge is if we're devoting our, our engineering staff, our planning staff at considerable expense, I think it would be good to have just a benchmark, like on the back of an envelope. What are we looking at to put an HOV lane uptown to downtown? What are we looking at? Because we're not talking about the overall uh, region. We're talking about expenses that will be actually incurred by our council and by the Saanich Council. So for me to be comfortable having our staff jump wholeheartedly into this, which in principle is something I could support, I think just to have a ballpark estimate of what do these two models of transit cost for that specific corridor, since it is Saanich and Victoria that would be bearing the cost, so. Um, I guess the question that, that I was going to ask and probably follows on that is, um, is to ask for that, to start off with the, uh, the 60,000 foot level, which is first the understanding, so correct me if I'm wrong, if you could find more detail, but to understand that the, um, the rail, and, and if we just take phase one, which is from downtown to six mile, is 750 million. Um, could, and, and hopefully it's one third, one third funding that our portion would be 250 million. Um, but what, is that not comparable to that we would spend in the next 20 years for business as usual anyways? Perhaps you can express, under, so we can understand that it's not either or both. Right. It's the, the 250 million of local share is a bit different than the 250 million of a business as usual because you have to do the splits on top of that as well, but there's no federal funding on the business as usual. Um, the cost of business as usual, as we've talked about before as well, comes at a price at the customer as well, is in order to support rapid transit in this region, not only do we have to get our new customers, as you know, we've heard me talk about choice riders, suits and seats, all that stuff, but we have to maintain our existing riders. And so business as usual, while we can make some pretty good improvements to help transit keep going, at some point we're going to have to look at, well, like as transit needs to get that travel time advantage and that reliability. So those are the struggles we have with business as usual. That's why we keep calling them the interim measures. Um, but I guess the question I have is what is the cost of business as usual? Well, the cost of business as usual, what we had done was looked at adding you have to continue to add buses to the network. It was 250 million, and that included looking at HOV lanes and adding buses. What happens is, is if a bus continues to take longer to do its regular routing, you have to just add more and more buses for no advantage to the customer. So that's the, the rapid transit project was building infrastructure to provide better service. Business as usual is trying to put more buses on the road to continue to maintain that service. Okay. Thank you. Well, um pick up on comments if I can just ask on um, Councillor Bryce has a question or you go ahead first uh, Councillor Bryce just uh, on a clarification because I, I want to make sure that uh, uh, this is understood that even though this route is in Victoria and Saanich uh, and say we're contemplating interim measures the cost would be borne by BC Transit Commission not by Saanich and Victoria. Do you want to elaborate on that? Because this is a regional project. <laughs> yes. No, um. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe just stop there. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, 
Yeah, the costs that would be associated with the transit improvements would be shared between the province and the locals. The locals in this case is the commission. If there were items identified through the Victoria and Saanich councils that would be specific, like uh, changing the structure of the sidewalks to something, moving utilities underground, the incrementals, those would be over there. <laughs> so yes. Th thanks, Erin. I just, I think that we have to keep remembering that this is a vital part of the regional network and the people who are traveling down this road every day are coming from all parts right. of the region. Can I just get your help on, on I'm, this is gonna be a really fascinating three years for a lot of reasons, one of which is because there's a provincial election in the middle. Um, and so you try and visualize what you accomplished this year, what could possibly accomplish next year and then what you try and pull off in the final year um, in a very practical term. So I'm looking at the orange bar or arrow and, and we're all sitting on that arrow right now, is that what you're telling me? Mm -hmm. And how long are we gonna sit on that arrow? <laughs> <laughs> the schedule that the CRD has been working on on their local funding task force is to have a technical report which outlines the options available to the CRD board and I believe that's in April or May with then they're gonna to go to the board and ask for direction in terms of, well, how, how do you want us to proceed now? What level of engagement do you want from the public? Not knowing what that answer is gonna be, the schedule would be is that the final technical report would be done by September. So there is a bit of a gray area because it depends on the level of engagement. Are, um, I think we've talked at the CRD board before, is are there certain options around funding that we're gonna drop that we're just gonna say we're never gonna have an appetite for those, so let's not go forward. And so, so by the fall of the this fall. year, you move off the orange arrow and goes to whatever, and I can't read what phase That is said, the uh, detailed business case, which looks at an independent review and Partnerships BC gets engaged to do their full assessment. So it doesn't go to senior government then, it goes there to get this work done. And that would take? The business case takes between a year to two years. So <clears throat> we're gonna spend this three year term moving that yellow arrow one box. Mm -hmm. Could you go to the slide on interim measures? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Let's go there. <laughs> That's why we're here. <laughs> and I like the big happy face that yeah. sort of forms. Uh, I figured I was on to something. Yeah. <laughs> <clears throat> so uh, as best I, I mean, my eyesight's not great. So I mean, we're the, the I'm looking at the existing on the on what my left, and then is uh, so it goes coordinated signals like TSP all the way to a fully segregated right away. Okay, so the coordinated signals we've almost got. We are almost there. We're just on so the, close. Just on Douglas. And just on Douglas. Saanich and at the entrance to Uptown, I think is the one in Saanich. Yes. Something. So we haven't got that on a McKenzie or a Shelburne or a Hillside. Uh, uh, we are working with um, our partners, so yeah. within Saanich and Victoria, to identify further intersections, and the Ministry of Transportation and Infrastructure is also looking right. at other intersections that could help us there. Because once they're physically in a bus, you just need the intersection done, right? Okay, so that, that's doable relatively short term. Now the next one is Q-jumpers, uh, so we've yep, got those jumpers. on the highway. We have those on the highway. And, and so we're all. working with the uh, Ministry of Transportation right now to look at could we extend the queue jumpers if everyone can picture where those are at McKenzie and Tillicum is if could we extend them uh, the problem with a queue jumper and same with transit signal priority is unless the bus can get there it doesn't get the benefit of the priority so those are some of the things we can look at as well and what's the next box peak bus lanes so that's saying peak, oh peak yeah so like peak only bus nine. lanes so it's okay. looking at uh obviously we have higher traffic in the peak than we do in the off peak so what can we do there and then when you go to a full bus lane that's because you have all day traffic and peak volumes that you need to accommodate all day okay and then the final is hov so um ha have, have is there data that says uh you know the congestion you know spencer to belleville I would presume it's not consistent all the way through. I mean, anecdotally, I have a sense of where it peaks and I know you can't see this one. <laughs> and where it, yeah, is that telling yeah. me geographically as well? <laughs> what this one is telling you is uh, by time of day yeah. and the variability, and we all know what the peaks are. Okay. We have 
data on from the bus point of view in terms of where our bus is. We have it by location. We have it. We have all that information to look at. Well, where would we get the best bang for the buck when you put priority in? That's what we need to work on when we investigate priority studies. So I was just thinking, you know, if you went Spencer to Helmican, what could what of that menu could be done quickly? Right. Helmican to uh, Mackenzie, what could be done on that menu quickly? Right. And then you go to Tilikum, and then you go Tilikum, and so you kind of Rather than trying to figure out, mm -hmm. uh, you know, one solution from, you know, the legislature to the Malahat, which, you know, we could all do, but I mean, it, you put a bunch of engineers in a room, it'll take a while. It, it just seems to me like if there's that kind of menu, is is am I onto something there? Is that possible to try and get some of these interim measures sooner rather than later? In, yeah, in I mean, it's we can take the corridor and break it into pieces because yeah. there are different profiles even within specific corridors. There are things that we could, uh, for lack of better terms, pilot, um, mm -hmm. specifically with like transit priority signals. Changing the way in which we operate the signal can just be done and piloted over a week. And that's what we're doing when we do the testing. So are there things we can, because we all know that we could just continue to analyze it and look at every single vehicle and their impact and every single pedestrian movement. But until we try something, we're never really going to know what the impact is. And then we could do the same on Mackenzie or in Victoria could do the same on Hillside, try and identify specific, the worst congested areas and, and put in. Yeah. I, I just have a sense, that, and it's not your role, but our role, that when we you know, go to the next set of all candidates meeting, just simply saying we move the yellow bar from one box to the other probably won't be enough. <laughs> and well, let's go two boxes <laughs> over. <laughs> there, there is a slide, though. I mean, I think one of the important ones, the slide in there where you showed uh, uh, that one. So to a certain extent, this is almost, hi this is highlighting your well, that's, priority. That's well, volume, this, but that's this not This shows contested. where our passengers are carried, but it doesn't show where we're losing speed. So we have other charts gotcha. that show the average speed of transit in certain parts of the corridor. That's ah. where you'd want to highlight those and say, let's start there. So that's the one we need to yeah. get our engineers and you together on yeah. and, and work on that for like this year's quick fixes. Yeah, because you sort of see that, I mean, that sort of looks, and again, my eyes deceive me, but it sort of looks like uptown to downtown corridor is, is the highest, most Yeah, highest and if, volume. if you bring in traffic volumes, the chart is almost identical. Uh, and that the traffic volumes is what would impact our speed. So there is overlaying chart. It's easy to see. That's why it's, there's many different ways you can look at it. OK, so according to my rule book, I think I probably tried to keep to a question. So now it's an opportunity for Saanich councillors to make comments. Councillor German. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I'm certainly excited about the opportunities for transit down the Douglas Corridor, um, but I also am mindful of the question that Councillor Madoff uh, asked about land use, and your answer was the partnership that is led by the municipalities. And that's what I'm really excited about, because I think we have in front of us right now, uh, as two municipalities, an unbelievable opportunity uh, to create uh, a project uh, that would be an incredible legacy for our citizens, for the citizens of the region, and really arguably for the citizens in some respects of the entire country, if not planet. And the opportunity I'm talking about is the opportunity for our two municipalities between co cooperating between us to plan and create a dense new community that in the Douglas corridor or as Councillor Isaac has named it Midtown to create a, a, a dense new community that is an attractive place to live and that is in fact becomes virtually a, a lifestyle choice for citizens of all demographics. Uh, it, it's, it's huge. Uh, it, for me, it's the kind of thing that you probably have a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity, and certainly once-in-a-political-lifetime opportunity, that's for sure. Uh, it, it would allow us to create a, a, a very sustainable new community in what is arguably, and I, I'd, hate, I'd like to find somebody who could argue against it, the number one location in the entire region. It is a, a corridor now that is tired, is in need of redevelopment, and yet is virtually perfectly located in terms of transit, 
in terms of proximity to the city of Victoria at one end and what's going to happen in Senate around Uptown at the other end. So it has, in that respect, huge sustainability implications. It's the perfect place to put a new community. Uh, it, it has an opportunity, I think, if we are put our visionary caps on, to contribute to a solution to global sustainability issues and indeed to regional sustainability issues by, by planning a new community that is on, on the absolute leading edge of uh, measures to minimize input of energy and resources and indeed to minimize output of waste. To create the kind of uh, community that when we go to conferences we hear futurists start to talk to us about, I think we can do it. As at least start to plan to do it in the near future. Um, it addresses, it has the opportunity, I think, to address critical social issues. By planning into the new community, we would cooperatively design uh, long term planning for how we will address those. In the way Vancouver, for example, uh, put 25% of supported housing into False Creek North and Coal Harbor by doing it on a on a long-term, big-scale visionary planning process. I think as the opportunity to contribute in an incredibly positive way to the quality of life uh, in the region by putting development and very, very attractive leading edge development in the right place. That's very good for the citizens we have in the region, but it's also incredibly important to the future economy of the region. We're, like it or not, we're in increasingly going to be in competition with urban areas around the world for wealth, skill, and talent. And we're really going to have to ask, why do they want to come here? I think our big economic ace is quality of life. And if we built appropriately as we redevelop and change, and keep in mind that we can really enhance that with the right time for development, uh, that can do nothing but a benefit to us. I, I think it has the opportunity to improve our own bottom lines hugely by over time bringing to us a, a flush of new truly sustainable taxes and I think we all know that if we are expanding outward constantly that those tax revenues that we get in the short term from redevelopment or for new development that moves further and further out are unsustainable so I'm ho and by the way why the whole corridor and why between our two municipalities because I think the opportunities become magnified as you look at a bigger area. Uh, it's wonderful to have something like Dockside Green in State of Victoria. But really what we want to do is we want to create Dockside Green on steroids. Uh, no offense to anybody. But that opportunity exists. You know, it, it's there. Uh, it, it is huge. And the other thing, if we go bigger, is we have the opportunity to, great, to create greater interest and greater investment. I have a, a presentation called The Natural City, some of you have seen, and I happened to show uh, about two years ago to people at the FCM Green Fund. And at near the end of it, I showed them an opportunity in the Douglas Quarter. And unsolicited, one of the, or two of them there came up and said, yeah, and we'd, we'd fund that in 50 cent dollars up to probably $450,000. So they, they would match us in that level. They're not going to match us on an individual project. They're not going to match us in a, in a small area. So, I mean, I'm not going to think in the, in, ever that at this meeting we're going to make a decision. But I want to put that out there and encourage us as two councils to look at that opportunity, hopefully in a future joint meeting, as to how we might move forward with a really visionary long-term plan for this, this area. You know, um, the, the tools are, are immense. We, I also ran into a group called Clover, Clover Point Cartographics that do 3D rendering using G GIS data. They recently modeled the whole UBC campus. Um, and I just asked them, I said, would you be interested in modeling the Douglas Corridor? And the answer, of course, was yes. And you could have a situation where in any of our councillors, anybody came in, we had a complete model uh, of the whole corridor. You could walk through it with your smartphone and look at potentially what it was becoming in the future. And I, I just think those are the ways we have to go. I think Aaron's 
transit feature plan is a very exciting project, but what, what, without any intent to insult, I think the opportunities it creates are way, way more exciting. So I'll leave that comment out there. Thank you. I want to thank other Saanich councillors for giving some of your time to Councillor Dermot. <laughs> oh no, we, we've got a lot of time. <laughs> You've got 14 more speeches in 45 minutes, so do the math. So, Councillor Murdoch. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I'm going to uh, just say that I appreciate and support the, the spirit of the comments from Councillor Dermot and, uh, and the discussion paper that uh, uh, Councillor uh, Isaac brought forward. Um, my, uh, my comments, though, I'm, I'm supportive of that process and, and like to see us continue to work together to ensure we are going to achieve some kind of uh, not some kind, uh, uh, I think what is a, an excellent vision for that corridor. Uh, my comments, though, will be more along the lines of uh, the interim measures and uh, what we can do to get people moving. Because I think we all recognize that our, especially our major corridors, but probably just about all of our corridors are heavily congested and uh, people are getting stuck. And we need to do something that, that's not going to allow us to wait five, ten, 15 years uh, for rapid transit. Uh, so I, I'd like to see our, our councils give some direction. I know we're not doing that today, but uh, at a, a council meeting in the very near future, um, to our, our staff to take BC Transit up on its offer to begin planning uh, for some of those interim steps that are going to free up the congestion in some of those corridors uh, while we continue to plan uh, towards a bigger plan for, uh, for rapid transit. So uh, I'll be uh, discussing that with some of the uh, some of my fellow councillors to see uh, what we can bring forward in the very near future to get that started, and I'm equally excited about that opportunity. Although the vision's maybe not quite so grand. Thanks, Mr. Mayor. I um, I too want to uh, thank BC Transit. Uh, the project is an exciting one, and uh, some of us have already said that. Uh, we see some great opportunities uh, to re-energize that corridor, most of which is in, in uh, Victoria, but some is in Saanich. Fortunately, the road is the ministry's road, but you know, the way <laughs> we can work with them. I agree that we need to look at interim measures. One of the things that I've heard, and I've got, I've got a, a report of how many pass-ups have been happening at UVic, um, and it's significant. It's, um, I forget the month I have here, uh, I think in January alone, there were uh, 5,800 pass-ups on uh, 4571 on routes servicing UVic. And one of the issues is that when we look at the network, um, interim measures need to be addressed. Uh, UVic uh, apparently has changed the start of some of their classes. So that means people are standing at bus buses, but BC Transit finishes their rush hour uh, transit at 8.30 and yet there are still people standing there because uh, starts of school courses have moved. So there needs to be some coordination with some of our major uh, employers. I was thinking about D&D &D as well as we look at the Craig Flower Bridge coming out and uh, some of those. Um, one of the intermeasures maybe out to the west is running along the, uh, the shoulder. I know that when the western approaches were built, there was plenty of room there to run uh, buses along there. There's no doubt that there's amazing opportunity. Um, I think for Saanich and Victoria, we need to ensure that we continue to work together. I know our staff have been working together, our planner and engineers and staff, so there is discussions. I know Victoria is still waiting to adopt their OCP. Um, but for us, uh, I also think we need to um, have a working relationship. We need to ensure that this corridor does become a walking, cycling, people, type spaces and that people feel comfortable waiting for a bus. I'm, I really like the new transit shelters. It really sends a message. Uh, it's really important. Uh, bus, uh, bus users always used to be, you know, they'd have those bus stops. It was just not inviting. So I really uh, uh, applaud the new uh, shelters. The other part is I think we have to ensure that we both uh, as jurisdictions don't um, chip away or uh, at the right of way. In other words, um, when we, uh, you know, as this plan uh, evolves, we gotta, we got to ensure that the right-of-way uh, stays there. If anything else, we probably need to uh, 
acquire more right away through um, either DPs or redevelopment. But I think that's a really important one because I know uh, we lost some right of way um, years ago around the LRT and at, the, at Tillicum and stuff. So I think it's going to be important that we both work together, especially around the corridor and to ensure that the right of way stays whole and if not, improve it, not reduce it and uh, ensure that the corridor becomes a people place, safe walking, safe cycling, great transit. Thanks. Thank you very much. A question I forgot to ask, and I'll just throw it out, and someone can tell me later on. As we move ahead, would we allow a new development to access Douglas Mid Block? And it's just a question I do have. And when I look at what we have got here, like it's been said, it's a great opportunity to change my way and our way of moving around the region. But I would hope, and the one thing I did notice about the previous plan, we wanted to put more down the corridor. And as you look down, everyone was squeezed in tighter and tighter. And it was not a friendly place. On the drawings, it looked very friendly because we didn't show that many buses and cars. But in reality, it could be very tight. And I hope we will consider that. And I believe, too, and like a number have said, we will be looking at Plan B. And Plan B is. I guess in my mind, it might not be just for four, five, six years, but as what we might do over the next 10 to 20 years. Long term, we would like light like, rail, but until then, what's the best plan as we move ahead? Thank you. Thank you, I'll be very brief. <laughs> Try not to. Um, I also th feel very strongly that the mayor was onto something in terms of uh, pushing forward with the interim measures. I know this discussion was about the Douglas Corridor, but I do like the idea of looking at those interim measures to achieve quick wins um, over the next while. In that way, increase ridership and demonstrate the viability of transit, um, increase the ridership and increase folks uh, being more familiar and used to it. And uh, my second and very quick comment will be that at the same time, I also think we should continue and enhance our land use planning with that eye of the complete community along our transit corridors. So in, in that order of priority too. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I made my comments earlier about uh, tying land use um, to transportation. but. Um, I, th I think it's really important to, uh, to talk about the affordable housing uh, issue in our area. And uh, I can see adding density uh, along that, that corridor would be uh, very useful, um, particularly for workforce, for workforce housing. Um, we've also got the new shipyard contracts and so forth. So people are going to be looking for somewhere to live. Uh, and, and an interesting thing that's always uh, intrigued me, uh, it's been done in some areas. Um, some successfully, some not, is the idea of pre-zoning. And I would just maybe uh, ask our planning departments, both in Victoria and Saanich, to just uh, kick that idea around a little. Um, again, sometimes it, uh, it inflates uh, real estate values. But in other cases, and, and speaking, I am in the construction community, and talking to UDI and uh, Construction Association and so forth, um, they like certainty, and if they know that there is an area that can be developed and set on one side uh, for development, whether it's for commercial or for residential or for whatever, um, then they can make some plans. Uh, and it, it's vital, I think, that we, we tie this exercise uh, to the development community because we can't build. We don't build, but developers do, and whether you like them or not. They are an essential part of, of, the, uh, of the, the program. So that's all my comments. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. This is a joint meeting, so I'm going to speak to my Victoria colleagues and kind of echo, I guess, what uh, some of the other Saanich councillors have been saying about uh, an interest in, in targeting some uh, interim measures. I think that um, it's always frustrating. It's taken so long even for this signals uh, issue to get resolved. Uh, I mean, months drag into years, and it, it's sort of painful to watch. But I think that uh, if we could set some uh, targets, some real timelines, the great thing about some of these interim measures is that you could have some immediate results, but you also 
have a fallback position that if they weren't achieving what you wanted them to achieve, they are relatively, in the scheme of things, um, on the more on the less expensive uh, side of things. So I do think that, um, uh, sure, we have to keep planning for the big plan, and I, I think uh, some of the things that have been said about uh, the opportunities um, are very exciting, and, and we will get there. But in the interim, we have to move those buses faster uh, down Douglas Street. Uh, seeing those buses uh, pass you by in your car will be another incentive for people to opt for public transit. And at this point, all they're doing is seeing the buses stuck in the gridlock along with them. So um, it will have, I think, a, a snowballing effect. And uh, I think it's something that we should um, really try to put together a package that has obviously with our own staffs and with transit staff um, guidance, uh, some reporting back timelines that we stay on top of this. Uh, yes, I was going to pass everybody else did because Councillor Dermott took all our time, but that's fine. <laughs> Sorry, no, I'm just kidding. So I'll just say a few comments. I think it's a great presentation, but what really um, shocked me is you have this, it's great, we're getting together, we're bonding, this is wonderful, we're going to look at this as a full full corridor, and then suddenly that was that little pointy arrow. And, and our life as politicians seems to be always in three-year lumps. And the mayor put it very much in perspective for me. So um, I'm pleased that there are some interim measures, and I'm kind of excited to see that perhaps we can deal with these at the, at the immediate point. But uh, look forward to the long-term vision where, um, you know, this, this Douglas Street, this corridor, is our entrance, our face to the community coming in here, and, and both with Sanich and the Victoria, I think, can really in the long term enhance it. So um, I hope I can be around long enough to see all that happen, either um, in, in my nursing home or um, on this council. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Um, and I'm going to uh, bring start uh, for the Victoria side. Um, part of the benefit that we've had at the City of Victoria, and it wasn't presented today, certainly could have been a, a value. I know we focused more on the transportation. But in the City of Victoria, we have finished um, our downtown plan. And our, our downtown plan, which basically takes it from downtown to Bay Street uh, through the Douglas Street corridor, talks about the densities that we've already done and, and what we want to see there. So whether it is maximum building heights of, of 50 meters or 60 meters, talking about the density and, and all of that, that, that planning has been done. Um, but the important piece that allowed us to move that forward was to actually get to that determination of where is our rapid transit lane going to run? Because where we put it on Douglas Street, or originally there's the couplet option, which then meant it actually may be more in Blanchard based on, on how we were running. So it was important for the preliminary decisions that our council and Sandage Council made of actually where is the corridor. And that allowed us to address our downtown plan, which we've done a lot of work that, that talks and speaks to many of the land use planning issues that have been highlighted that Councillor German would like to see and others. We've addressed some of those issues. And, and even further out of the downtown, we, we've now moved into our official community plan, which is just in the final draft form and I think will be coming in Director Day in the next uh, two or three months, I think. Beginning of April, which again highlights where our town centers are going to be in, in, in relation to the Douglas Street corridor and what's within those town centers and urban centers. So when you talk about that full overall arching vision, you know we can assure you that that we've looked at residential, we look at the urban core, we look at the commercial, the type of commercial, um, all of the amenities and parks and all of that. So we, we certainly have a solid benefit, and it's something that we can move forward. But it's about having that decision about where that corridor comes. Certainly the thing that I've heard here today, and I think, frankly, that we may need to uh, amend slightly the recommendation, is that based on who, I mean, I don't even know if it's based on who's in power. Ultimately, it's going to be 10 or 20 years, I think, before we actually get to rapid transit. But some of the decisions that we will make on an interim basis will de be determinative of where that's going to happen sometime in the future. And so, um, we can't always wait for, for things to be perfect before we make a decision, because frankly, there's never ever perfect, which means you never make a decision. I, I think there is great opportunity through these recommendations to say, yes, let councils individually look to request BC Transit, seek funding to complete the Douglas Street corridor, because that's gonna help us in our planning in more detail where we wanna go. <clears throat> and what I think I've heard today was, we need to do that work, and we can do it fairly quickly, that then allows us to move to the interim measures. 
very quickly. Uh, and that is going to have the biggest impact and relief. But we will nail down uh, in the ability to work together. But what we really need out of this joint meeting is the fact that we're going to have to agree on what those interim measures are. Um, we cannot be planning in Victoria that we're going to have side-by-side -side, you know, rapid bus, but you're doing HOV links because you know, those cars and those buses all collide somewhere around Finlayson, <laughs> Tolmy, right? So that, this is the benefit about working together. Uh, we, we can reflect within our own official community plans and others um, where we want to go as cities and, and, and enhance those corridors. But certainly there's an opportunity for us as a council to provide direction individually to our staff to work together to make those interim measures work because those are where we're going to get the biggest, easiest gains, low hanging fruit and, and something that we can celebrate in three years that we kept that corridor open moving and moved uh, development through four of it. So that is mine. I'll then go for Councilor Madoff and run the table that way. Um, thank you, Your Worship. And in, in the interest of time, I will be very brief. And having also cleverly crafted a comment in the form of a question earlier, I think I got my main principle out on the table early. And I was just really pleased to hear how much common ground we have. And I think being able to meet together as two councils, I just can't underestimate the value of that. I know last night at the Oak Bay Council, there was a presentation made on a land use application adjacent to the Oak Bay border, but in Victoria. And I just thought that was such a step forward in terms of courtesy, but also with the Oak Bay Village, we'd like a seamless village. We don't want it to look like, well, there's Oak Bay, here's Victoria. So I really think with, with that happening last night and this happening today, it starts to make the impossible start to seem possible. But I, I, I am going to be very brief, but I don't want in any way that to be taken as a diminishment of the importance of this discussion. I think it's one of the most important discussions that we can have as councils. And what I would emphasize again, I really believe the importance is to design from the property line to the center line. And if we do that, we'll really have something that not only is successful, but that will be an incredible economic generator for our, our, in, our entire region. There was a, a comment um, made earlier about, um, about this being a once in a lifetime opportunity. And I'd have to say that I see that not as a once in a human lifetime, but once in the lifetime of a city or a region. And this really is a historic opportunity for, for us to work together and do something that will be seen over the, the, the trajectory of, of history, not just over one or two terms on a, on a council. The, um, oftentimes when you visit other jurisdictions and they're involved in major land use planning or, or transportation planning, it's being used as a tool of repair to try to bring something back from often, unfortunately, the brink of disaster. And we're in such an enviable position here that we're looking at this as an enhancement because we already have such strengths to build on as well. So I think what I want to emphasize um, as I close is the opportunity to really work together in a substantive way, council to council and staff to staff to make sure that we really get this right. And all of that captured within very significant community engagement. So again, thank you so much for the opportunity for us to meet today. Thank you, Councillor Thornton Joe. Uh, thank you, Your Worship, and, and I echo uh, all the comments made by my colleagues uh, on Saanich Council and, and uh, the comments that were summarized by Mayor Fortin. Um, I can't um, emphasize enough how, how much I appreciate having uh, the two councils meet together and have these discussions on major issues that we all are encountering. And uh, I, I know the last one we had was in Victoria, and so we got to speak first, and I was the one that went over on my time, so I'm keeping my <laughs> comments. Uh, <laughs> short this time, but I appreciate uh, having the opportunity and I do echo the comments that the others have made. Thank you. Councillor Young. Uh, thanks. I, I certainly agree with others who said we need to plan for improving service now. Uh, I also agree that we need to um, plan for um, rail in the longer term. Uh, we don't, I, I hope it's not quite as long as, as the mayor suggested, but we also need to plan for transitioning from one to the other. Uh, my instinct is, I assumed that would be easiest if we, if we had the, uh, the right of ways where they will eventually end up, but uh, that's a technical issue, and if it's better to, to plan to have, have our uh, bus lanes in one place and plan for the rail in a different place in the future, I, that's, I'm, I'm prepared to accept that. Um, I do. I, I do think that um, obviously 
bringing, bringing the uh, interim measures in means that we can postpone some of the tough decision about decisions about where the terminus will be in, in Victoria and, and indeed uh, even a tough decision about, about um, the entire route. Um, let's uh, be under no illusions though. What we are going to be proposing to people is going to look very much indeed like what we proposed to people what, three or four years ago uh, when we went through an exercise to look at um, rapid bus on Douglas. And we will have the same objections and we will hear from people who are going to lose the parking in front of their, uh, their shops. And if w our objective is to minimize objections, this will not proceed. We have to, I think, keep our eyes on the goal here. We are trying to achieve something great we are trying to change the structure of the city. We are looking to the long term. I think we should be prepared to accept some of that blame, that some of that pain now, uh, in recognizing that the sooner we show people what is going to be happening, the more development along Douglas will reflect that, will reflect the future, and and will be attuned to it. And I think, I think we should be prepared to say yes. There will be objections. But yes, there, this is worth doing. Let's start it so that people can have as much time as possible to plan and adjust. Councillor Alto. Uh, thank you. I'll also just keep my remarks brief. Um, I, I don't think there's anything that's been said in the commentary period that I would uh, disagree with. I'm particularly excited, actually, by the opportunities that I think we have in the interim measure period. It's actually really encouraging to hear what all of the different options are before us. And I think we should get to work on that right away. The, the discussion that's been precipitated around the relationship between transit planning and land use planning for me is particularly key, and I look at it from both directions. I think not only does the transit planning have to reflect the land use, but the land use planning has to anticipate what we're thinking of for transit. You know, in the new official community plan for Victoria, which we're really hopeful uh, will adopt soon, uh, we know already where we think new transit will go, and that's reflected in some of the proposals that is in the plan around what the density lifts are allowed and what different zonings will look like. And, and I think it's incredibly important that one of the lenses that we use in anticipating decision making around land use is that lens about what will the transit look like in that area. You know, if I'm looking at applications on such and such a street, I need to think about in five years and 10 years, will there be transit there? What might it look like? So I think it's a two-way street in that sense, is that you know, one affects the other, but we need to keep in mind if as many councillors have said, this is a priority for us, and I think it must be in the development of the region. We need to uh, look at our choices around uh, applications for zoning and development from the perspective of how that will be affected by the transit that will ultimately be adjacent or nearby. Uh, so I think that's a very important thing to keep in mind. And someone mentioned uh, just briefly the notion of the, the uh, timing around these decisions, and I, I think back to a thought I had some time ago when Victoria was presented with an application for the renovations and the really exciting new ideas around the Royal BC Museum. And I asked the question then, how does that relate to a potential terminus for either light rapid transit or a more conventional type of transit change? Because I think all the plans I've seen have a terminus in that area, somewhere around the Belleville Government Douglas kind of triangle. And I think there's an enormous opportunity as the RBCM uh, plans proceed to anticipate some relationship in those two things. And I really hope that we don't lose track of that opportunity. Uh, so I'd like to leave it there, but I also really would love to extend my thanks to Sanders for having us. I, I found this meeting and the last one we had incredibly informative, and I hope we do it on a regular basis. So thank you for your hospitality. Councillor Good. Um, I echo what all, the col all my colleagues have said as well, and I applaud the fact that we're working together on this. Um, there's just a few things that I, just comments that I have that I came up in the, in the fall, is that we need to engage and, and encourage our citizens to get onto the buses now. Um, I see we can't, we have to change the behavior and I think we can start to change people's behavior now. Granted the buses are relatively full at, at peak times. Let's try and find some sort of solutions to encourage them to get out of their car and take transit now, because I think they can, by doing that, they can also have a voice in this. We can engage them to give feedback. We want to encourage a new transit ridership. And uh, 
I, I think there's a valuable resource in our citizens. If they're on the bus, if they're taking the buses, they might have some wonderful solutions that we're not. Um, I, I'm not a, I don't ride the bus often, my daughter does, but I think there's a lot of people who might say, geez, why don't you try this? And I think that there, there's an opportunity to partner. And with that Google bus ride, uh, the, the Google, what is it, trip? Okay, how about a, a, a Google, uh, what do you think, suggestion, uh, same thing, sort of some interactive um, way to, to engage our citizens and let them participate in the discussion that we're having and to, to, to further this discussion with the rest of our residents. Thanks. Councillor Isaac, and then we'll look to um, Mayor Leonard to take us home, so to speak. Yeah, to start with the transportation question, uh, I strongly support moving forward with the interim measures, and I think it, we, it might be beneficial to have a recommendation that's even more prescriptive uh, perhaps asking transit staff to implement high occupancy vehicle lanes along Douglas. So that's a discussion we'll have at our respective council tables. But I think we can sidestep the issue. We don't need partnerships BC and discussions of P3 models if we're talking about line markings and road painting and curbs and closure of parking spaces. Those are fully within the existing powers of our municipalities in partnership with transit. Let's save the the, the contemplation of big, uh, I think, financial models uh, to how we would implement rail um, in the medium term. And I'm, I share Councillor Young's view that I'd hope that would occur uh, in the so sooner rather than later. Um, I think rail should be achieved maybe on a pay-as-you-go basis, and that's where these broader land use plans could come in. That if we contemplated tens of thousands of new units of housing, with through higher density, we could require developers to pay into uh, an infrastructure and public amenity fund, which could largely fund some of the improvements that were required, or at least provide a large pool of capital uh, to leverage senior government funds. So to turn to that broader land use question, I provide a brief that uh, everyone at these, this table has received, but if anyone in the gallery is interested, I do have extra copies, and it calls for a midtown master plan. And I think it moves beyond this idea of the Douglas Street corridor because that ties us narrowly, I think, to transportation. And transportation's important, but it's only one part of a much broader planning exercise that has to occur. And as Councillor Derman and others have suggested, this is the natural site for densification and growth in our region. It's an ideal location for what we would call brownfield development, which would keep development out of our region's farmlands and forests, and also out of existing established neighborhoods, whether Cadbro Bay or Maplewood in Saanich or uh, Fairfield or James Bay in Victoria. So we can avoid all these NIMBY battles that consume so much time and so much energy. So I think this is really the prime site for housing, for jobs, um, and for a range of public amenities, including transit and walking and cycling greenways. I think as density increases, we can build the capital reserves uh, to fund rail transit in this area. And we can view this area not as just a corridor to move people who live or work elsewhere, but as the heart of a new innovative 21st century urban community and as the heart of the region. And so I'm very hopeful that um, I don't think we should allow this broader planning exercise, the discussion of do we empower our planning staff to talk to builders, to people in the construction trades, to residents. I don't think we don't have to allow the idea of a broader midtown master plan to hold back the interim measures and the transit planning, but I would almost hope that at some point our councils can sign off, uh, empower transit to move people more quickly down Douglas Street so we can really, um, I think, direct our resources to dreaming about what that area can be, how it can enlarge our tax bases, how it can provide affordable housing employment and everything else. So I'm, I'm hopeful that we'll devote a future meeting and hopefully a hopefully a future meeting in a few months' time, uh, to discuss this idea of what could a Midtown Master Plan for this area look like with so many benefits and more than a win-win situation. There's probably a dozen wins that could be strung together in terms of all the attributes that people have discussed. So thank you. Well, thank you. Um, as last time, this meeting's run uh, quite smoothly and quite productive. I, I want to acknowledge that it's uh, a lot of the credit goes to our staff for doing a lot of preparation before we got here, uh, that uh, the agenda is uh, thought through and the presentation's thought through and just the whole logistics so that our time is put to good use. Uh, really, we covered a lot of territory in uh, an hour and 45 minutes. Uh, the, the staff reports that are going to both of our councils uh, it's, it's not that they're inadequate, but I think the discussion has shown us that we actually want more. 
and and that uh, covering off the recommendations on the on, on where BC Transit needs to work to take uh, uh, us from one orange bar to the other on LRT is fine over the next uh, three years. Uh, but clearly, everybody's spoken in favor of interim measures, and, and hopefully, maybe that won't be figured out by the time you get a report to both of our councils. But at, at least reference and a work plan about how we could make that happen in the short term, I think, would be well received by, uh, by both councils. So, um, if nothing else, that's a wonderful accomplishment to come out of today's session.